you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 417. If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. Warren Buffett. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Now, guys, before we get started, as promised, Indie Film Hustle Academy is having its huge Black Friday, Cyber Monday sale, which will last for the entire month of November. You're going to get up to 70% off of all of our courses, and we just added four new courses, How to Pitch to Investors, the Indie Film Funding Formula, the Beginner's Guide to Success in the Indie Film Business, and the Guide to Networking and Building Relationships in the Film Industry. And of course, my new course, The Complete Film Distribution Blueprint, How Not to Get Screwed by Predatory Film Distributors, is now out and available, and at the lowest price it will probably ever be again. If you want to check out this sale, head over to ifhacademy.com. Now guys, today on the show, we have filmmaker and film entrepreneur Jay Horton. Now, Jason is a filmmaker who figured out how to make a living making films. And I know that is a weird concept, but he actually makes a living and all he does is make feature films. And in our conversation, we go over his techniques, what he does, how he does it, how he monetizes all of these films, and what is the secret sauce to his success. Now, he is not a billionaire or making millions of dollars by any stretch of the imagination. He'll be the first to tell you, but he has figured out how to make a living. That means he only does this to generate revenue to support him and his family. And that, to me, is the dream as a filmmaker, to be able to just do what I love to do and get paid to do it. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jay Horton. I'd like to welcome the show, Jay Horton, man. How you doing, brother? Very good. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Thanks for doing this, man. I'm I'm a fan of what you do and how you do it. Uh, I, I, it's rare to find filmmakers who get it <laughs> and, 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 and figured out how to make a living as a filmmaker, which is you are in the top – one percent of one percent of one percent, <laughs> and 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 yeah, but like like you say in your YouTube videos and and a lot of stuff, you, your content it's like I'm not rich by any stretch of imagination, but I make a living doing what I love to do, and that's why we got I wanted to kind of bring you on the show to explore about. Yeah, yeah, and to be to be fair, it's taken me a long time to get there, and a long time to change my mentality from you know I'm going to be Quentin Tarantino to I'm going to make a living as a filmmaker. Right. And I think we all, you know, uh, you're, you and I are in similar vintages, uh, as I'd like to say. Yes. So, um, you know, when Quentin came out, we were probably in our, in our youth, if you will. And everybody of our generation wanted to be Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, Quentin Tarantino, 
you know, Rick, Richard Linkletter, you know, John Singleton, Steven Soderbergh, like they're all those guys. But Tarantino has that rock star, you know, vibe to him uh, when he came out. Yeah. And, and I think he, as wonderful as he is, he did hurt a, a generation of filmmakers because we all figured out like, we're just never going to be Quentin Tarantino. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard pill to swallow for a lot of filmmakers. We're just, we're just never. And it's okay because nobody's ever going to be Quentin Tarantino. No. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into the business. Okay. Well, I basically, I got started doing movies because I couldn't do anything else. I, I, I was small. I didn't like sports. I watched movies all the time. So mm-hmm. that was, I was always a major focus of mine. And then, you know, speaking of Tarantino, he, you know, Reservoir Dogs came out when I was 18, like coming out of high school. Mm-hmm. So like that, like for the first time, I was like, "Oh, that's what a director does. This is this is a director. I could do this." Now it took me another, you know, four years to get into college and you know, kind of start studying film. But you know, by the time I had finished there, like I was chomping at the bit to make a movie. So you know, I did my first movie right out of college. You know, we saved up a few thousand dollars, uh, me and a friend, mm-hmm. and just. We had the Panasonic DVX when it first came out. DVX, what yes. was it? The A, sir, or yeah. was it just a straight up? A, just uh, you have the I, A. I, I, I believe we had. I think it was before the A. So it was the first. I, you had first of, generation. Yeah. Got it. I'm pretty sure it was. Wasn't that a great little camera, yeah. man? I love that little. It camera. was. You know, I I still like like the look of it. Sure. Um, I did a. I did a. I, I mean, I did a really one of my not ladder movies, but like mid career movies, like way after HD had kind of taken over. Mm-hmm. I think it was like 2010, mm-hmm. but I liked that look so much. I actually shot one last feature on it. You know, that I still have it's called a trap, which I did quite a bit, but yeah, it's, I love that look. That look was awesome. And it was just, and for people who just don't understand what that camera was, it was the first 24 P camera. So it was the first time we could see a film look inherent in the image before then all we had was like the canon xl which was ugh, it's just oh, oh it was horrible disgusting it was disgusting and then you met and you mix that with final cut pro i think it was four yep. maybe four or five I, yeah, I, I think i started on five but i'm i'm again i'm not it's 100%. around yeah it's around there so you combine those two and remember you had to plug in the cable and then let the let the, the final cut like run through the tapes to, to digitize yep. high res, which was standard def. And I know everyone listening, like it's just two old farts talking about the olden days, but it was, you have <laughs> right, no understanding right. how awesome that was. Like it was insane. Yeah. So I still had, you know, the mentality that, you know, I'm going to be big. I'm going to be a Spielberg. I'm going to be a Tarantino and be Rodriguez, but I'm making this small movie. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was laying the groundwork for, you know, my later career. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we we finished this movie. Um, it was originally called Rise of the Undead. M- many years later, a distributor changed it to Rising Undead. But mm-hmm. anyway, we sold it to uh, York Entertainment, like just right out the box. I don't know if you know, heard of York, but uh, mm-hmm. okay. So York was like one of the first like predatory distributors. So uh. and I didn't know I didn't know anything about distribution, marketing, nothing. I was what just was like, the hey, deal? Make my what was the deal? Oh God. Um, 12 year license. <sighs> um, the, the sales fee was like the, the cap was over 50,000 or it was 50,000, something mm-hmm. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I honestly don't remember the rev split. I, I think it was like a 60, 40, maybe something like sure, that. But you never made it. You but, never saw a dime. Not from them. No. <laughs> Did you get so, the movie back ever? Um, years, years later, which I'll get into that a little bit later. That's how I discovered Amazon and started doing sure. self-distribution was through sure, that. Sure, sure. Uh-huh. But, um, so anyway, we finished it, we sold it to York and I was like, and they did release it, you know, like, a, you know, it was in Blockbuster, it was in Hollywood video. It was like, and I didn't care so much about the money at the time. I was like, Hey, I have a movie out, you right. know, maybe uh, we'll see some money next year. That, that and, this was, can I stop you right there for a second? That yeah. is the worst disease that we as filmmakers have when we're first starting out. We're like, oh, well, I see it on the shelves or I see it on Amazon or I see it on iTunes and I've arrived and oh, I don't care really about the money. You'll never make it as a filmmaker if you don't no. change that mentality. Agreed? Oh, totally agreed. And what I was about to find out was that 
no one else was going to give a shit that my movie was in Blockbuster. <laughs> you know, so like I, I, I get it out and we're living in New Orleans at the time. And, you know, we were planning to make the move to L.A. Katrina happened and we moved right after Katrina. Mm-hmm. So I get to L.A. and I have this movie and it's, on, it's in Blockbuster. And I'm like, L.A. is going to just be like, welcome, come direct our movies. <laughs> You know, and here's 20 million. Like here's 20 million. Yeah, here's right. or 20 million or even one. I mean, I wasn't quite that, you know, uh, delusional, <laughs> but I, I was still delusional. I mean, I was thinking a million or 500,000. At, at or, least that's like know, nothing. At that's least. Like nothing. Yeah. yeah. At least. Yeah, it's at nothing. Least. They hand those. So they just hand those out to anybody who walks in the door. <laughs> So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm querying production companies and studios, you know, and just, you know, if I ever do get responses, they're pretty much like, LOL, you know, (laughs) send. (laughs) So, but so, so here I was, you know, I directed this feature film, you know, I graduated college, I'm in LA, nobody will hire me for anything. I'm like, hey, I directed this, I wrote it, I edited it, I could, you know, I could do editing, I could, you know, I could do, I worked the camera, I could do camera work. Could I mean, I I couldn't do work for free. I mean, like I couldn't get a job. So I was back working at Starbucks, you know, it's like, you know, six months goes by, still no job. And I finally get uh, an assistant editor job on this uh, rinky dink horror movie. Uh, I think it was called Butcher House. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the special effects guy on that was getting ready to shoot his first movie. And I still had that DVX and his DP had quit. I wasn't really a DP, but he was like, oh, you have the camera? You know, we're shooting tomorrow. Come shoot my movie. And that kind of set me off on my path. You know, I worked for that guy. And then his EP was a filmmaker named Jean-Claude Lamar. I started editing and directing for him. Then I got noticed by the Garcia brothers and I started directing for them. You know, I just every that just beget everything. And mm-hmm. I kept moving. And it just it just kept rocking and rocking. All right. So then. So you you have a fairly long IMDb, I've noticed. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you, how many movies are you popping out a year now? Oh man. Um I mean at my height I was probably doing 12 a year. So one um, a, one I, a month, I, one a month. One a month. So one of the companies I started actually both the companies I was directing for their their business model they were doing micro budget movies like between ten thousand dollars or like sixty thousand dollars you know mm-hmm. they they got a little bit higher later on but mm-hmm. anyway so they're making these movies they'd get like one you know b-level actor they'd have him for a day they had had the movies pre-sold and they were just impressed by my ability to be able to work within their time frame you know because we would shoot these movies in five or six days sometimes less Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I would have less than a month to edit them, feature films, you know, put them sure. out like the that date, that release date would be set before we started shooting. You know, like they had a both of the companies had set deals with different distributors and aggregators. So like they would we would start shooting in April and the movie would be like on the shelf in June, just like boom. And they would do them, you know, at least one a month. There was one month with the Garcias where I shot four movies. You know, we did one in uh one I know. we did one uh pretty much and no it was it actually that period was concurrent like mm-hmm. one after another so we did uh we did one movie in one day i'm sorry two movies in one day one movie in two days a uh, movie in five days and then another movie in four days how do you like, do boom, two boom, movies boom, boom, in a day like i look i've shot fast oh, not, not in one i'm sorry not in one day Oh, okay. you're asking. I got you. I got you. Yes. Yeah, okay. How do, how do you shoot a movie in one day? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I mean, you do. I know how to do it. You just put the camera up and you let the actors act, and it's basically master shot theater. <laughs> well, it can be. Um, what what worked for me, and now I'm not saying these are great movies. Sure. You know, it, we still shot them in a day, but sure. they're better than you would think. So, like, what we would do is, you know, we had we would go to sets, like stage sets. And, you know, we would so we had so many scenes in the living room set. We'd set up three cameras. We would mm-hmm. run each scene twice, you know, pr- I mean, you know, sure. unless somebody flopped or something. But we'd run two times full through with two completely se- different sets of coverage. So I would end up with, you know, six pieces of coverage per scene on okay. average. OK. And one of one of my ops was he was re- he was really good. So we like we would set him on the second take on a long lens and be like, just fish, get my inserts. And I wouldn't even always have them set. I would just be like, yeah, get what you can get. And then everybody else would have standard coverage. And my editing background helped me do yeah. those as well. 
Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, can, so, I, can you please tell the audience how important understanding editorial helps you make these kind of films? Yeah, I never wanted to be an editor. I never wanted to edit anything. I edited my first movie out of uh, necessity. But mm-hmm. you learn, like, if you want to get into directing or writing or any ed- editor, it's one of the best positions to move up. Mm-hmm. It's like not only are you learning the entire process, what works, what doesn't, how shots fit together, how much you actually need, you're also setting with the director and the producer, sometimes the financiers. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky enough to be on set, you're you're sitting right there with the main producers and the visiting, the people that visit, you know, like the bigwigs or the guys with the money. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I've got movies, you know, small movies financed from being on that set and talking to those people, you know, so I, awesome. I, I, I think. I think editing's probably the best, you know, if it may, maybe DP on bigger things, but like in, in, in the indie world. But I even even DP as as an editor as editorial allows you to figure out what you need and how fast you need to get it and what you absolutely right. need. And then also it's one thing being on set, but it's another thing being in a room with producers, directors, financiers yes. for Arguably hours. two, three weeks at a time. Sometimes, I mean, in your in your case, a lot faster. But generally speaking, it could be months that you're working together. Yeah. You know, and those totally. relationships build up. And one of my very first gigs after I started working, besides the horror movie, I was operating camera on this uh, 24 hour shoot. It was this weird ass comedy documentary. I'll spare the details, mm-hmm. but we were. I was sitting there with the main producer because we were doing some live TV editing on it, mm-hmm. and you know, so I talked to him for a few hours, and you know, offhandedly mentioned that I was a writer. And he was looking for a zombie script. I didn't have one, but I was like, dude, I could write you one in two weeks. And, you know, a month later, we're shooting Edges of Darkness, which was, you know, my first uh, California, you know, directing. Very cool, man. So, so, all right, so, so you're popping out a lot of movies a month. What is your business model as a filmmaker? So kind of explain that to, to, film, to, to the audience. So – at the time when I was making all of those, I was working for other people. So I was like a hired gun. I'm watching mm-hmm. their business model. So the business model was basically you, you know, you have to, it's a quick release model, you know, like you have to put out so much material a year, you know, so, and, and most of them did okay, but these aren't, you know, they make it for 50. They, they might make 75,000 in the first year, or they might make a hundred or, or it might break even, you know, they had a pretty good track record for not losing, mm-hmm. but you know, it was, it was a volume business for those guys. And so I'm sitting there watching these guys. And I'm like, okay, I get the business side of it. Now, if I can, if I can fine tune the creative and, you know, make these a little bit better, which, you know, I believe you can, mm-hmm. it's like, that's, that's a good, that's a good model. Um, and then, you know, I, I started working for a larger company for a while, an animation company, which kind of took me away from filmmaking for about two years. Mm-hmm. And then last year, a uh, year before last, I started getting back, ta- basically taking their business model, but creating it for myself. So like that, that's what I'm doing now. And I chose a slightly different path with what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. So like I, I, I had talked to a producer because so three years ago, I shot a movie called Death Day. Uh, or it was called the campus. The distributor changed it later. I have that a lot. <laughs> but, <laughs> they, do, um, they tend to do that. Yeah. This, but this movie, I think, I think our hard budget was like, I don't know, 45,000 and maybe another 20 or so in post. But mm-hmm. so it, it was decent for a micro budget. And, you know, we shot it anamorphic, you know, I was, I was pretty happy with how it turned out and basing my past work. I was like, oh man, I'm going to make hundred grand first year on this easy break even, mm-hmm. you know? So it comes out in like late 2017 or early 2018 and it just wasn't the case anymore. It it failed pretty spectacularly. Like I didn't make anything and I'm still like, you know, dealing with investors and whatnot on it. So I was kind of in a spot where I'm like this business model that I came in professionally on, like it's not really working anymore because like th- these guys, they were making these movies so fast, put out one a month. But, you know, they weren't particularly they weren't all great uh, they, and they weren't making money anymore. But in, you know, 2010, 2014, oh, yeah, the money was still make, flowing. Yeah. Yeah. You could make a movie for $50,000, put Eric Roberts in it and still <laughs> like make money. 
you know, not anymore. Now, now they're like Eric Roberts. Oh shit. I got 30 of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I remember I was at Cannes a few years ago and one of the, uh, I overheard a producer or a distributor, somebody saying, if I see one more fucking movie with Eric Roberts, man, I'm going to scream. No, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned yeah. Eric a couple of times because I, one year as a post, uh, as a post supervisor worked on three Eric Roberts movies, just myself. And I'm like, he must have done about 20 to 25 movies that year. And it's just, he just diluted his, whatever value he might have had. Um, you know, there's a, and there's a handful of those kind of actors who could do that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, and, and, and for people to understand in 2010, 2011, DVD was still a thing. Um, oh, it was huge. It was still a thing. And at that time, streaming had just started to, to the idea started to germinate and Netflix had just started to, to do it. And as the technology got better and better, but so you could literally put out a crap movie for a fifty thousand dollar crap movie with Eric Roberts, and you'll pull a hundred grand off of it. Just oh yeah, comfortably, comfortably. Those days are are gone. Yeah, in that totally. in that sense, in that sense. So how did you switch your business model currently? Okay, so the other thing that happened, um, I, and I think it first happened around two thousand ten. Uh, Amazon unboxed, which became Prime Video Direct. It was somewhere around that time. I think we were still putting them up through Create Space, mm-hmm. like they, it was a self uh, book publishing thing. But they sure. had a DVD, and when streaming first came out, you could you could upload your movies through there, and hardly anybody knew about it. Film right, wise. and you and you so, you were basically a, a big fish in a very uh, a, a, well a yeah, small pond because so, it wasn't a lot of people, a lot of competition. It, exactly, and that you know that first movie, uh, the rights hadn't expired, but the company had went under, so I got the rights back on that. I still had the rights on Trap, and I think one other. So I put these three movies up, and I kind of just forgot about it. You know, they were making uh, five or six bucks a month, something like that, something small, but. I think it was 2000 a year later, like 2013, one of these movies, like just out of nowhere, like I wasn't promoting it, nothing. It just, it just popped up. Like it was making, I think it was around, I think at the height it was making almost 2000 a month, but nice. like it was bouncing between a thousand and 2000 a month for almost 12 months. Like I made, I made the budget on it. Then this movie was at least six years old, maybe seven. Mm-hmm. And I was like, for the very first time, I'm like, oh, I mean, there's something to this like self distribution thing. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I finished my stint directing for the other guys, and you know, I had the failure with uh, Campus, and then was like, I'm gonna try to go back to this self distribution model, you know. So, and a producer had told me that they were having a lot of trouble, you know, with you know narrative features. You'll get lucky, but he's like, you should try documentaries. And at the time, I had no interest in documentaries whatsoever but i was like well i mean i like to make stuff let me let me make a few and see what happens so i just really as fast as i could make them i made i think it was like six documentaries and i did these in like i want to say two months oh wow like Like full feature yeah like between between 60 and 90 minutes like, okay. so with streaming, with streaming, uh, documentaries, like if you hit over the 60 minute mark, you can kind of, you can sell it as a feature, mm-hmm, sure. but anyway, so between 60 and 90, so like I would, and I mean, these are talking head kind of documentaries. There would be, you know, B roll, but you know, most of it's stock, you know, I do, I do the interviews in like a day, you know, like I would set up five people, interview them for a couple hours a piece and just boom, knock it all out. So, and I was just basically throwing shit at the wall. I was I had subjects I was interested in, but I had no idea what the market would bear. So I'm trying to figure that out. So I do these six and and each one's in a completely different genre. You know, one about a dog rescue, one about medical cannabis, you know, one about um, uh, Brexit. Um, I, I forget the other three. But and so anyway, so I put them out really quick. Mm hmm. And and so what so, and what made you choose those topics? Were you actually going after hot topics or hot niches or, th- or something like that, or what was your mentality behind it? I, I was I was trying to figure it out. Um, and at the time, I was whatever I had access to, like what was the what was the path of least resistance? What am I interested in? What could I spend a couple of weeks on and not want to puke? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I had a friend that ran the dog rescue in Vegas. So like I went down there and did that one, the, uh, the Brexit one, I have a filmmaker friend 
that's in the UK that wanted to shoot interviews for this. So I was like, okay, here's the interviews. Here's the questions. You go out and do it and we'll do like a rev split on it. You know, so he did that and then I posted it and distributed it. So I do these like six movies really quick and it is kind of just like testing the market. There's a, another thing that had happened is I had another documentary from way back when about Katrina that a friend of mine had made and it had popped up out of nowhere and was making money. It was another reason I decided on the documentaries. So through those six, I start to see, okay, like the dog rescue for one did, did well. Like I was making around a thousand dollars a month on it, maybe a little mm. less. How much but, did it cost? Know, I spent, um, nothing. I mean, my time, you know, I spent three days shooting it and probably f- maybe, maybe five days editing it. So it was all basically you used all the resources you had, which is camera and your editing yep. gear, basically that you already have paid for essentially. Yep. Yeah. I had my camera, a uh, small light kit, um, mm-hmm. sound. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much how I did all those. The only time, you know, and I, and we never paid, we always did it on a rev split situation. But if I was working with another filmmaker that was shooting the interviews, we would just work out a back end split on it and then they would do the interviews. But most of them was just me. And by the time those, cause, and again, these things, and at the time Amazon was still putting out movies pretty fast. So I would self distribute on Amazon through prime video direct. I would take the U S and the UK and then I would use a film hub to fill out, you know, any foreign or, or, you know, different platforms that I couldn't get to. Mm-hmm. And the, this was before Tubi had kind of, you know, sparked up, but it, later on that became a thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at these six, I'm looking at the, the dog rescue did well, the Brexit did okay. Um, I did one on filmmaking, which did abysmal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay, um, unless, unless I'm going to tie the filmmaking into, you know, like, you know, how, uh, how to, or something is, you know, just stuff about filmmaking. Not, not so much that yeah. didn't work out. So anyway, I looked at the success or failure of these six and then I started being a little more selective on my subjects. You know, like I moved in, I did one on uh, Bigfoot that did like it, it did crazy. Like I think I think I streamed 10. No, I know I did. I streamed 10 million minutes uh, for three months in a row for, yeah, for, for, a, for a Bigfoot documentary for a Bigfoot documentary. So I, it's like again. I, yeah. Okay, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, but okay, because so, I'm fascinated with this because um, – so Bigfoot obviously is a very niche audience. The people who believe in Bigfoot or want to follow Bigfoot, want to learn about Bigfoot. But it's a fairly dense audience. It, there's a lot of people who yes. believe in Bigfoot and want to listen to, about this and there's whole industries wrapped around Bigfoot. I even found out <laughs> – I found out a friend of mine told me that there was erotica, Bigfoot erotica. Oh where <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. So for anybody in the audience who wants to play a trick, this is what my buddy and I did. My buddy had a brother who was was you know these I mean, we're, we're we're grown ass men. So he's got a wife, he's got kids and everything. So he wanted to make sure he wanted to play a trick on his brother. I'm like, why don't you do this next time you're over at his house, go on the fa- on the on the computer on his laptop and look up <laughs> Bigfoot erotica <laughs> and just leave it there. <laughs> And let his wife find it. And um and it's not like pornographic. It's just like people writing stories about <laughs> Bigfoot, erotica. Like you're know, like, and he well, I'm not even gonna get to it because yeah, I read yeah, a couple yeah. of them yeah, and yeah. I was just like, Oh my god, there's there's something for every freak in the world. And if if there are any if there are any Bigfoot eroticas um listeners out there, forgive me. I just don't understand you. But um <laughs> But anyway, That's so that crazy. just I'm sorry I had to tell you that story. But no, anyway, so it. so Bigfoot that 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 niche is fairly it's kind of like UFO or Loch Ness monster or any yeah. of these kind yeah, of yeah. niches. So you basically just interviewed a bunch of like Bigfoot hunters or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean basically like with the Bigfoot one, um I took a look at the marketplace. Like mm-hmm. I I looked at probably 20 different documentaries on Bigfoot and there are a lot of them. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, so there is going to be a lot of competition here. But what I didn't see was there weren't a lot of just like introductions into the subject, like just oh. like a general, this is the thing. This is what cryptozoology is. So like, it seems like all the filmmakers are so focused on I'm going to provide new information or I'm going to show like this new picture of Bigfoot. And, you know, nine times out of ten, it's complete, like obvious, you know, bullshit. 
You know, so, but, but you're saying that 10th time it's real and there's a real Bigfoot. No, uh, <laughs> no I'm not saying that's real. Just saying it's more believe, a little, like it looks a little better. Sure, 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 sure. Right. So that's interesting. So, so instead of, so that's a, that's interesting for the audience to take a, a note of that there, if there is a lot of competition in a documentary space about a subject, an introduction to it might be a way in. And apparently it was for right. you. Yeah, or or it might be going more specific too. It could be either way. Depending. But you know, I, at this around the same time, I was also just like very late to the game, starting to get into the YouTube stuff, and I'm watching all these videos on YouTube. And some of the best marketing advice I have ever heard comes from these like the people that have been successfully grown their YouTube channels and do the videos about like how to grow your YouTube channels. Sure. You follow the right people, and the information is like it's gold. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're talking about retention. They're talking about how to niche down. Like, and and all of a sudden, I'm thinking about these movies because you're also getting something on Amazon called CER, customer uh, engagement ranking. You know, mm -hmm. which is this like nebulous thing that nobody can figure out, but it's how they base their rate of pay. And it's it's based on things like how long are you retaining your audience? How how are your reviews? Are people clicking on your movie and watching, you know, 30 seconds and clicking off? Are they actually watching it through? Are they rating it? Are they engaging with it? You know, it's what you know, a hundred different factors. Mm -hmm. But the retention thing really that they kept talking about on YouTube really like started seeping into my documentaries. I'm like, okay. So then I started thinking about structure in a whole different way. It's like, you know, it's not necessarily just this three act structure, peaks and valleys. How do I keep people for that, especially that like critical 15, first 15 or 20 minutes? You know, I'm not saying the rest of it's inconsequential, but you know, I start thinking, you know, like you don't have, you know, in this day and age on streaming, you don't have 10 minutes to get the audience, you know, like they used to say with screenplays, you know, you got, you have 10 minutes to set up your story. You got the first five, right? you got five pages. And if it's not, you're yeah. done. It, yeah. And, and now with, with the streaming stuff, I'd say it's maybe even less. It's like, if they're not into it in like 90 seconds, they're like, oh, okay, click off, go to something else. So anyway, the retention thing really like, uh, it, ch it changed things for me. Mm -hmm. The Bigfoot movie, like just uh, seeing how well that did and how the marketing worked, like how you can, you know, target a specific niche. I, I, it just it just opened it up. Like and now now when I look for subjects, I look for things that okay, what is something? It doesn't have to be supernatural, but what is something that has a group of people that are into it like these people that were into Bigfoot? So okay, so yeah, can you can, yeah? So how to explain the process of you picking your niche? And how you like? What are the checklist things that you need to kind of look for in order for you to spend at least two weeks on a project? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least I mean at least two. Oh, yeah, two, two weeks. weeks. Yeah, I, I mean, mean now and, it's like now it's uh, around two months. But yeah. okay, but yeah. <laughs> So, I love you. Like, I can't, I stand on this project for two weeks without losing my mind. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Most of filmmakers listening are like a year to two in like two weeks, even two months yeah. is, is a vacation. A, very, very short. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I start with my interests or something that I'm interested in learning more about. For example, I, like I'm not into Bigfoot, but I was, I was really interested to see why other people were. You know, like, and that was, that was kind of my focus. And I did a UFO one, uh, like in a similar manner, mm -hmm. you know, um, the dog rescue, I'm a dog lover, you know, sure. so I moved into that. But so the first thing I do, so like say, okay, I'm going to do a Bigfoot one. I Google Bigfoot, you know, and I start looking at what's popping up first, you know, and if, if like I can find the audience fairly easily, like where they're congregating. You know, there's a lot of like Bigfoot, for example, you go to Facebook and type in Bigfoot <laughs> and you'll get like a thousand you'll get, like, groups. Like, yeah. A thousand groups, you know, with, and, and there's hundreds of thousands of members in some of these. Yeah. Like, so, so I was like, Oh my gosh, that, like just on these Facebook groups alone, I can, I can push this movie. So, but, I mean that, that was a no brainer. The alien one was a no brainer. Uh, animal rescue stuff's a no brainer, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, but then you get into some, like I hear people pitching stuff all the time and it's like maybe a little esoteric or it's a little looser, like, you know, like we're doing one and you know, it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a coming of age story about, you know, growing up, 
you know, a, a, a little, little too broad. A little, little too broad. Way, yeah, way too, way too broad. Way too broad. You know, and, and or maybe the guy does have an incredible story, but like he started as a football player and then and then he became a scientist, and then you know it's just like too segmented, and there's not enough in the one area. Mm-hmm. So I try to find something where it's you know pretty laser focused in terms of audience and where I find them. So, so th- th- those are my main things. What I'm interested in, can I sell it? Now, when you, when you, so let's go back to Bigfoot for a second. So when you were marketing it, how did you, how do you go about marketing your, your films to the niche? Once you've identified the niche audience, how do you go about marketing it to that audience and and what the cost is involved? Okay. So most, most of it, at least to start was social media, like free stuff. Um, You know, on Facebook, I targeted the groups. You know, I, I would I created a page for it, but the only thing I would do with that page is occasionally boost a you know a post or a video to that target audience. I, I don't do a lot with paid ads, maybe a hundred, two hundred bucks a month probably total across mm-hmm. the board. Mm-hmm. So I would mostly just find these the audiences online. So I do the Facebook groups. Um and somebody had mentioned Reddit and I was like, you never see people promoting on Reddit. And I was like, oh, fuck Reddit. OK, but you have to be a lot more clever on Reddit because it's a it's a discussion based platform. So it's like if you're just throwing up a link to your thing, nobody's going to look at it. But if you establish, you know, a line of communication, then you you can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, so, But it's hard. I've, I've been banned from a couple of groups for, you know, throwing up some links. But for the most part, it's, it works good. And then the other one I discovered that no filmmakers are talking about, this is like a bonus tip, Pinterest. Mm-hmm. Like you, I, 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 I didn't even know what Pinterest was. I, I don't remember who recommended it, but I was like, okay, I looked it up, signed up, and I was like, oh, this looks like recipes. I, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But just just for shits and giggles, I put up – somebody had told me to do short videos. So I created a business account, which is free. And I put in like, I don't know, maybe a dozen, like uh, 30 to 45 second video clips from, I think, two movies, you mm-hmm. know, and you can put the URLs to where, you know, you want to send them in there and you can create your thumbnails, all that. So anyway, I do that, put them up and then just walk away. I'm like, OK, this isn't going to be nothing. Um, the next day I look at it and my Pinterest page had like 35,000 page views, like in less than a day. And like, but what was the, if, but what was the topic? What was the niche? Um, one of them, and it was, it was so I did two. One was the Bigfoot one. You mm-hmm. know, okay, okay, Bigfoot. I see it. The other one was, uh, oh man, was it Brexit or the, it was either Brexit or the Animal Rescue? I can't remember which. All one. three, all three have very passionate groups. Yeah, but they, they, they just they. Blew. I was like, wow, and they were actually watching the videos. Like the like the average video watch length was like I don't know twenty seconds, and these were you know. 30 to 45 second videos. And like, I'd say 10% were clicking on the link. So I was like, Oh, that's, that's, cause they, and they, huge, they give you all those. That's huge. Yeah. They give you all those metrics. So I was like, Holy shit. So like twice a week I would put up like 30 clips within, I want to say th- the first three weeks I, I had over 300,000 page views. I, I, that's about as high as I've gotten a month now, but that's, Every month, that's about what I do. Somewhere between two and three hundred thousand. So you're using you know, Pinterest I, as a marketing machine for your projects, and yeah, it's free. And, now, and it's free. Yeah, totally free. I, I do a little bit of paid promotion. Just I've been experimenting with it. How is you know, it? it how like is the, how is the paid paid on Pinterest? Um, it, I mean, it's kind of like Facebook, but you can do lower amounts. So like I'll, I'll boost something for like five bucks for, you know, whatever, five days or something just to, just to see, cause every now and then, cause I put a lot of clips up there. So I'll put 10 up there, six, six or seven of them. will do like the thousand views in the first day. And then like three of them will do like one, you know? So like, I'll take the ones that do one and I might give them a little push, you know, get just up to, to around, you know, f- yeah, just a, just a. Yeah, push it. And then there's a social media scheduler called Tailwind that works mm-hmm. specifically with Pinterest. Mm-hmm. And it does all this like scheduled reposting. Because if you have multiple boards, you can take those pins and then repost them to other boards. And it, you know, get, opens up the audience. So like I'll do that once a month and I just set them up on a repeating basis. So like and, once every month or two and that post will come back up. And how many boards do you have on Pinterest? 
Um, I don't know, maybe 20. Uh, okay. It's like, I, I mean, I have a lot of projects and I don't do them. I started doing them specific to just like one project. And then mm-hmm. I started grouping them into projects because mm-hmm. the more boards you have, the more you can share between the boards. And, and I noticed, like, and again, I've only been doing this for three four months now. So it's mm-hmm. fairly new, mm-hmm. but you know, and this also coincides with COVID. So it's, it's hard to tell where the bumps come from, sure. but I, I have had like on my library titles, like maybe a, I have 15% bump in overall sales, you know, since I started implementing some of these things. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's hard to tell. Yeah. So uh, what is your distribution model right now? Is it strictly Amazon only? And then we're going to talk about Amazon in a minute. Um, but uh, is, do you do, do you do TVOD, SVOD, AVOD? Do you go anywhere else other than Amazon for your, um, f- to generate revenue? So this has all changed for me dramatically in the past three months. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So prior to February, my model was to do Amazon, US and UK on my own. Put Mm -hmm. put it up, directly upload it to Prime Video Direct, do Film Hub for the rest. That Mm -hmm. that's pretty much what I do. Maybe maybe do some physical media myself, either through my website or do the media on demand thing. Mm -hmm. Um I I personally never had a lot of luck with physical media, but I, it's something that I want to like get a little more into in the coming months, even though it's mm-hmm. it feels like it's going out. But um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, the um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought too. Um, oh, revenue, uh, TVOD, oh, SVOD, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was that. Was, so um, I would launch a movie in TVOD, and I would keep it on TVOD as long as it was making. More than I think three hundred dollars a month was my cutoff on that, mm-hmm. and if it was falling below that, you know, then I was just like, okay, let me switch over to SVOD. Mm-hmm. So it was, you know, start out at TVOD, move to SVOD, and all Amazon, all happen. Amazon, all, all Amazon, all Amazon, mm-hmm. and sometimes that would happen very quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, like say I put a movie up, and you know, in the first week I have rented, you know, whatever three units. I'm like, okay this isn't working, move over to SVOD. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, and it's, I, I know it's not a, a popular opinion, but when you're dealing with movies this small, I, like, and I still feel even with the changes that SVOD is still overall for small movies superior. Mm-hmm. Like the, the, the discoverability is just, it's, it beats the rates, mm-hmm. you know, like if you, if you do this little movie, it's so hard to get people to rent an independent feature. Mm-hmm. You know, so let alone buy, that, let alone buy, let alone buy. Yeah. So, and maybe this is something they'll change. And I know some other filmmakers that have had better luck with the TVOD, but me personally, I never, had the, the amount of marketing work that you need to push this, to make the same amount of money on TVOD that you make on SVOD is it's astronomical. I mean, yeah. I can put a movie out on SVOD, even at the one cent an hour and turn over a thousand dollars in a month fairly easily like not every time but fairly easily mm-hmm. but on tvot you know I, i'd be i'd be lucky to crack like 200 bucks you know on on those particular titles that's it's, it's interesting because um i've been trying to i've been yelling that from the top of the mountain for a long time as well that tvot is essentially dead um for independent filmmaking it, it only works if you have an audience that is passionate about your film or you or the subject matter or something like that, that you can drive them. And that's going to be a short window of maybe two, three, four months. If that, um, that's the only time that for an independent. And again, for the budgets we're talking about, we're talking about, you know, 50,000, 75,000 and below yep. kind of projects. TVOD is, and and I would argue even a million and below TVOD is still a tough, it's still a tough sell unless you're unless you're pumping yeah. it through a lot of marketing or you have recognizable talent, like really recognizable talent. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't until I actually started uh, like networking more with other filmmakers that were putting out movies and selling them where you realized how little some of these movies were making. Mm-hmm. You know, like some of these movies, man, I, I, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I just signed a couple of movies with Indie, right? So I've been looking at a lot of their other movies mm-hmm. and like there's some ex, there's some excellent stuff there made, oh, yeah. you know, say but be, between 75,000 and say 150,000 and mm-hmm. that are making 20, like, nothing. And oh yeah, there's some that are making nothing, and there's some that are making yeah. 
you know, 50, yeah, a 100. few bucks. Yeah, a couple yeah. bucks up, yeah. yeah um, man, it was sobering. <laughs> it, no, it is. It's in, in uh, you know, I think that's one of the things I love about indie rights because they have both of my films as well is that they allow filmmakers to see the truth of what films yes. are really worth. And if you don't market them and if you don't do them, this is what's going to happen. And it's sobering. It, it is sobering for filmmakers to kind of understand that, like, oh, I don't have the the prettiest baby. Um, no, yeah. you don't, they, you know, <laughs> there are ugly babies, unfortunately, in independent film there, yeah, you know, it's like, no, there's no ugly probably, babies. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably some, more than, than cute babies. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. But everyone thinks that their baby is gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and I understand that, but it's just the, the cruel reality. And then now let's talk a little bit about Amazon and how yeah. brutal they have been with independent oh filmmakers. I mean, so so, so, so my experience early on, they were made, you were, you can make a lot of money through S5, like 12 cent. Oh my God. 15 cent. And, and you sound like, it doesn't sound like a lot, <laughs> yeah. but, but you can make Dude, 50, 15 cents. Can let, you imagine? Let me, <laughs> let me interrupt just for a second. So at 15 cents an hour, uh-huh. my Bigfoot movie. Yeah. Was, so on Amazon, I made, uh, I think $1,600 on it in uh, July. Mm-hmm. Right. Or uh, I'm sorry, June. But this last this, same this last June. This last this, June? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just uh last month. Okay. So that exact same movie at fifteen cents an hour would have been like twenty five thousand dollars, something like that. My Jeez. math ain't great. But I, I know it's over twenty. Or around wow. twenty. So yeah, you could have been making Yeah. So at, and and it and you can count on a new release like kind of maintaining that basic ballpark for about 90 days. Sure. So, you know, like, I, I mean, I could have cleared, you know, 50 to 60,000 in three months on that movie that I made for, you know, less than $500. That one I paid for a couple interviews, mm-hmm. but you know, you know, it's, that is, Oh my gosh. When I think about that, I get, I, I mean, I get emotional. I get the clip. Cause yeah. I mean, now 50% of titles are going to make a cent are going to make one penny. Because anything, any movie with a CER of under 50% is one penny. The sliding scale stops at 50%. I'm like, whoa. I mean, the, the Bigfoot, for example, at the CER was 43%. Mm-hmm. 43%, one penny. 50%, five, five pennies. So, like, it so you would have made, made, as- you would have made 6,000, or six, seven, eight thousand bucks, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. With just a, f- with a 5% differential, which is, and, and then try to figure out why your CR is what it is. There's no figuring it out. I, I, I used to think there was, I was like, if you have enough data, you can crunch it, you can figure this stuff out. But there's so many unseen factors. I heard from another filmmaker that has a relationship with someone that works in Amazon and they wouldn't tell them what the factors were, but they said there's well over a hundred factors that go into CER. You know, it's not just your rating. It's not just how many minutes you stream. Like it can come down to they put more weight if somebody watches your movie in New York City as opposed to watches it in, you know, bumfuck Indiana. Mm -hmm. Like there's a there's a difference. Or this person that watches the movie purchases more other stuff. So your CER is higher. So you have no you have no no control. No control. There's no, and there's people that just say, "Well, if I just if I just do the advertising right," if, and I was one of these people. I, I would I'd preach it when I first started doing YouTube videos. I was like, "Just you know, you do your marketing right. You do this. You do this. You do that. Your your CR will be higher. You can still do it." And I was still defending Amazon. I was like, "Oh, you know, they're 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 toughening up standards because they got a lot of crap on there." Mm-hmm. They, you know, at, but uh, it, like it's gotten ridiculous now, and and now they're purging even more movies. I, I just I lost a movie uh, two days ago. They just uh, decided just they just like I'm out. We're done. Just pulled it, and it had a CER of over fifty percent. So why did so, they pull it? And they don't tell you. They won't tell you. I mean, now it was not doing num- good numbers, so mm-hmm. maybe it was that. But who knows? <sighs> so so now what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so what I do now, I I no longer do direct to Amazon. I still use Amazon Mm because it's still, it's still a thing. I still make a thousand dollars a project there, Mm -hmm. but I don't put them up myself any longer. Like if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna do a release, I'll either, I go to indie rights first Mm -hmm. 
and I'll see if they want to pick it up. And if it's something that they're not interested in or if it's something that maybe I'm not so proud of, mm-hmm. I'll just I'll go straight to Film Hub and I'll give it all to Film Hub. I give and up how is and how is and how's Film Hub working out for you? Is that is it, are they paying? Are they getting you like what I I'm curious yes. to see. I haven't heard of a lot of success stories with Film Hub, so I would love to hear what your experience yeah. is. So I've had good experiences with Film Hub. I still don't make as much collectively off Film Hub as I was making off Amazon, mm-hmm. but it it grow it grows every month. So what I like about Film Hub is that you know the the first like two movies that I ever got on Tubi TV were you know through Film Hub, you know, and I I do pretty good on Tubi through Film Hub. Um, uh, it's not it, it's 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 good. I, I, they pay quarterly. And they pay out uh, – I think it's like they sleep at like quarterly and one. So they're always like a quarter behind, which mm-hmm. I don't think people under understand that. So they'll they'll bitch about it. And the, the numbers aren't astronomical. Like unless you get on you – know, like a, a hit out on Tubi, 90 percent of those channels are making you know pennies or a few dollars. But it does – it gives you a little more uh, visibility. And then if you get onto a good platform, you know, it can like I'm just now getting to the point where like my titles on Tubi are making more than what they're making on Amazon. But it took me almost a year to get there. Right. And there's also not all your projects are on Tubi, just a handful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because like out of Tubi, I think I have I think I've uploaded 15 movies onto Tubi. And mm-hmm. out of the 15, I think six are on Tubi. I mean, on Film Hub and six are on Tubi. So if, what I'm what I'm hearing is, and, and well, first of all, the what they have to ask you, like, what do you do if you have a hundred fifty thousand dollar indie film with no talent attached, and it's a narrative film? Well, my first thing, I probably wouldn't make a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> right? But, 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 but there's a lot of, but there's a so lot of, like, a lot of yeah, filmmakers yeah. out there have that mentality. Like, it's only one hundred fifty thousand. It's only a quarter of a million. It's only a hundred thousand. And it's a, it's a drama and I have no stars in it. And they expect that like in today's marketplace, as we're recording this, what are your, what, which, what are the options? Because your business model works because your overhead is extremely so low. low. Like when you make a movie for 500 bucks and you're generating consistently a thousand to two thousand, to 3000 bucks a month, or let's say for the first, you know, let's say you, you generate off that movie 10 grand over the course yeah. of its lifetime. That's a business. <laughs> like yeah. you make a product for 500, you make 10 grand off of it. And it's a volume business as well. You can't do one of those. You need to do 12 in and order to, to keep them going. And, and you got to keep them going and keep, so, but you also have a library as well. So how many films do you have in your library that you own and are generating revenue with, even if it's a few bit of dollars a month? Uh, I think 20. Right right now, I think 20. All right. So you have 20 features that you're generating revenue with. Yeah. That's in your, This basically is the film entrepreneur method is what I've been preaching with my book. Like yeah. overhead really low, find a niche audience, market to that niche audience, rinse, repeat. And just yeah. and just keep doing it and build that library that you own and control to continuously generate revenue for you. And when there's a new platform, boom, have a new revenue stream yeah. and you could just dump in twenty films. Yeah. And uh, I, I think what I'd say about the the hundred thousand dollar yeah thing yeah is because uh, I still like my passion is to still like do narrative film. Like I, I I believe me, I just I love making movies. So I get mm-hmm. a lot of pleasure out of the documentaries, but I still want to make narrative stuff. Mm-hmm. But to be a hundred percent honest and you know, nobody wants to hear this, but I don't know how to make money on a hundred thousand dollar narrative feature without a star. Like I, I don't know. You might get lucky, you know, I could I, I have kind of an idea about what to do, but I don't know that it'll work. So what I risk. do now it's yeah, it's a risk. It's a, it's a huge risk. So what I do now is I treat the documentaries as – this is my day job. This is like my – this is my more fun day job. And then once a year, you know, I take some of that, raise a little bit more money, and make a narrative movie. And if the narrative fails, oh, well. You know, like I, I still have my income from the documentaries. You know, because I, I just don't see – like how at that level 
to have a sustainable business model making narrative features. I I, I, I know there's people that do, but I, I don't see it. So not without I, without stars or without really understanding your niche and yeah. really understanding the business about it and creating ancillary product lines and create like all these other things that you can do. It's just you've got to be so perfect. Like you can't, you can't be sloppy at all. Like your, your no. business model, you can be a little sloppy. You, you know, you're, yeah. you, because your budget's really low. Like when I made my, my last feature, it was about three grand. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I shot it in four days. Okay. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just, tr- I'm just making something that's fun and it's narrative. And it was, you know, it's, so it's a, it was for my audience and all that kind of good stuff. But if I would have made that movie for a hundred grand, Forget it. Yeah, I wouldn't even have known. I it just it's just so it's so difficult, and that's why I wanted to have you on as an example, as a case study for filmmakers to understand. Like this is better or worse, it is the new normal. You have to figure out how to generate revenue, and I applaud you because you've been able to create a day job for yourself that you control, you own, and and can continue to give you passive income. Like once the yep. work is done, that will continue to pay you something for a while. Yeah, I mean, I have you know, I have almost fifty. I have an almost fifteen-year-old movie that I still make a couple hundred bucks a month off of. You know, so I mean, I, I get pushback from people sometimes. They're like, "Oh, well, it's easy for you to say because you have." You know, whatever, so many projects or you just throw them out or you don't care about them. And it's not true. Like I care deeply about everything I do, but like I, I this is what I need to do to make a living. Like I, I am not, you know, I, I graduated, you know, I graduated college, but I didn't finish law school. I didn't do any of that. So like at this point in my life, like I can't afford to make a hundred thousand dollar movie and have it fail. Like I, I that's know, done. You're I done. Do that's it. you're done. It, it, yeah. it, 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 it will crush you. It would crush you. Yeah. I, I get it. I get it. And and that's what filmmakers don't understand because they'll take that risk and then they'll get crushed and they'll never come back. They'll yeah. never, they'll never come back into the business because they can't. Um, yes. and you've been able to establish yourself making these films and I, look at, at the end of the day, I always, uh, filmmakers always have this issue with art versus commerce. And it yeah. drives me, it drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. Look, we all want to be Scorsese. We all want to be Nolan. We all want to be Fincher. We all want to be Kubrick. Uh, and that's fantastic. And these guys are, you know, on the, uh, Mount Hollywood. They're, they're like, they're, they're, they're gods on Mount Hollywood. There's no question, but they come from a different world, different existence than the rest of us. Like this is like, if I, I've spoken to directors of that caliber. And when I tell them that I made a three thousand dollar movie, they 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 just you can see things Nothing. just it's like they, they don't it's like malfunction like short circuit Johnny Five malfunction like it's like freaking doesn't out compute. like it doesn't compute it, it, it they can't wrap their heads around that um, and because they just come from a completely different existence it's like an NFL player talking to a high school player like it's just. We both do arguably the same thing. We're both playing the game, but at completely different levels. And there's nothing wrong with either of them. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's just different. But filmmakers so much get caught up with the art and the dream that they look down upon what I like to call the blue collar filmmaker. Someone like that comes in as building a business around what they love to do. And you, I had another, I had another um, director on who does, uh, Michael uh, Fife, uh, Fife, and he does um, Lifetime movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lifetime movies. And all he did is like he pops out like four or five of these a year. And mm-hmm. he, he's, he's gotten built up to the relationship that he can just – he just gets financing from the companies and he just works. And he's just always working. He's flying to Greece. He's flying all over the place. He's make, And people are like, oh, you make Lifetime movies. And I, and I, and I, I told him that I'm like, <laughs> anyone who says that screw you. Cause this man totally. is living the dream that most filmmakers would kill to do. He's getting to do his art for a living. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And how, and how dare you judge what my art is or my art isn't and what you feel that it should be. 
I don't care. It's irrelevant. You know how many people don't like Tyler Perry movies? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people who despise Tyler Perry and the films he makes. He's mm-hmm. laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> all the way. All the way. <laughs> no, but real quick, do you use email lists at all? Or do you, do you yes, kind of build that? So I do. How, so, how, how, and then again, this is, this is something uh, – I mean you know, a lot of my business really has like blown up and changed so much over the last year. Mm-hmm. So – I would say actually even prior to like 2018, I was still pretty firmly in the like I just want to make I just want to make movies. <laughs> I don't care about the business. You know, it, it 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 took a good ten years of me getting kicked around before I'm like, okay, wait a Amen. minute, I do need to make I need to make some fucking money. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> so yes, I, I do use them. Uh, my my email list isn't huge now. I think it's like maybe five thousand. Okay. Um, I run it through my website and now through Patreon. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm collecting them and I, I, like I send out, you know, for, uh, a once a month newsletter and then I'll send out like kind of a, pr- a project specific one once a month and I'll kind of, maybe I'll lay some other titles in there as well. And you're now, and now you have a podcast, you have a YouTube channel that you're building up. Is that part of, are you trying to build yourself up as a brand in the filmmaking yes. space to, to, to attract filmmakers to what you're doing as another potential revenue stream or things like that. Can you explain what you're doing? Yeah. So the YouTube thing started out. um, Honestly, it started just, I was looking for, I was, I was, cause I I get questions online all the time about my business model and about how I make movies. So I was like, Oh, I like people seem really interested in this information. So I was just like, I'm just going to share some of this information. And, you know, I did a few videos and the response for it was so good. And I start looking at other people like yourself that were mm-hmm. working in the filmmaking space. And I'm like, oh, maybe this is a thing. Like I, I wasn't thinking about immediately monetizing it or anything. I was like, I'm mm-hmm. enjoying doing it. But let me let's let's see where it takes me. So I started I started doing it and, and get, taking it a little more seriously and watching the YouTube videos and you know building the channel. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm still probably a year away from making any real money from it you mm-hmm. know but it's it, it's something you got to build you can't just you don't just start and you're making money so it, I, I i i enjoy doing it and that's the other thing i want people to understand is like a lot of people look at what i've done with indie film hustle and my other companies and they're like oh well you know you've been like i've been doing this five years it took me two and a half to three years to start really getting traction and to quit yeah. my day job and to, you know, not do post-production anymore and only direct when I want to direct. And it took time. And that's, yeah. and like, even with what your business model is, one film at a time to build up a yeah, library. It, it all takes time. I mean, the, the documentary stuff, you know, it took, it took six or seven months before I was making like enough money on the documentaries that it supplemented my income. But that's, you know, that's, like was but that's fast. Money. That's fast, but that is, that is fast, but it wasn't automatic, I guess is what I said. But then like the the YouTube and thing and all that, those are, those are like long, those are long games, you know, Mm -hmm. and you know, you get, you do get a a few more eyeballs on your projects from that as well. Yeah, exactly. So that's hopefully helping. Yeah. You're, you're using the model. Like I'm going to show you how I made the Bigfoot documentary. And oh, by the way, if you want to watch the Bigfoot documentary, it's over here. For, yeah, you can exactly. watch it for free on Tubi or on Amazon Prime or something like that. Totally. totally. Um, and by the way, once Amazon kicks you off, it's done, right? You can't put that movie back on. It is. Yeah, it is done. Now, I know you guys didn't hear this from me, what? but um, there are filmmakers that will retitle, do new art, and then they'll upload through Film Hub. Like if you do it through your same account, they're going to catch you. But like, say you go to Film Hub or somewhere else and mm-hmm. have it put up, or create a new account with a new mm-hmm. title, you might get lucky. But most likely, the same thing that got it kicked off the first time is going to get it kicked off again. So the official rule is: once it's done, it's done. There's a few ways to get around it, but even if you do, is it worth the risk? I I, I don't do it. And you don't use aggregators. You don't use like an aggregator to put it up on iTunes or in Google Play or in Fandango or any of that stuff, right? No, no. I, I did I did an aggregator once for iTunes and I did it on uh, campus, uh, Death Day. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I think I made $75 with it. 
I, iTunes is really hard to push to. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so no, I don't, I, I don't, again, like, you know, I'm making these movies like so fast and so cheap. If I'm paying a thousand dollars per platform, like the movie might not even make that much. You so know, it doesn't so make I, sense. I, it doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah, I don't do it. I'll give up that 20% from film hub, you know, cause it's nothing up front, but mm. I, or indie I, rights I would, or indie rights or indie or indie rights. It's the same thing, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay to be placed. Very cool. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my sure. guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? If you can do anything else, if you enjoy doing anything else, <laughs> do it. I mean, I'm not saying, look, I, I am, I don't regret it. I've, I've lived a great life. I like, I do something I enjoy for a living, but it is not, it, it, it looks a lot cooler in the brochure. It's, it, it's not awesome. <laughs> And, you mean it's not like the, it's not like watching the the making of Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's not like that at all. <laughs> no, it's and it's, it's nothing like Entourage. But, <laughs> but uh, and then my my second part to that would be study. Like it, like if it, you know you're young, you're just getting started. Whether it's in school or on YouTube or in books, study business and marketing. Like, yes, be consider that to be sixty percent of a movie's success. It's probably more than that, but I'm going to say sixty. Like it, it's like it's it's more that's more important than the movie being good as far as it selling. You know, absolutely. Because so, there's business a business and marketing. There's a lot of good movies out there that no one watches, and there's yeah. a lot of bad movies out there that make a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Uh, probably to, to, especially on my narrative features to stop doing, trying to take on too much myself, you know, try trying to do too much. You, you, you need to like movies as a collaborative art and like you have to you have to give even even on the docks where I'm pretty much a one man crew. Mm -hmm. I still have people that I can count on to do this or that go to people who are experts in their area. Just, you know, don't, don't try to take on too much yourself. And what are three of your favorite films of all time? Three films. Oh, um, I'd say I had this changes week to week, but, um, the world according to Garp, the yeah. Robin Williams movie that means a lot to me. And a lot of a lot of my favorite movies have to do with what's going on at the time, and I just I bonded with my mother over that movie, like really, like in a really powerful way. And yeah. I just I always love, it. and it's one of Robin Williams' best dramatic performances. Mm -hmm. Great movie. Um, my second one, and again, I hate to, be, yeah, I always feel like self conscious when I talk about Tarantino because I don't want to be that filmmaker. It's like, oh, Tarantino, it's okay. Tarantino, it's Tarantino. all good, it's uh, all good. And I, I say Reservoir Dogs. And again, not necessarily like, you know, I think he's made better movies, but like Reservoir Dogs and when it came out, that was oh. my gateway movie. Oh, like yeah. it, that, I mean, I had seen all kinds of stuff, but it was right there. And then hearing him talk and talk about John Woo and talk about Walter Hill and talk about French New Wave. And all of a sudden it just opened up this world. I'm watching all these Godard movies and I'm watching, you know, the killer and hard boiled and bullet in the head. And mm -hmm. I, I, it just, it, and it showed me what a director could be. I, I, I just, I didn't, I, I, it, up until that point I had seen pr pretty much every Walter Hill movie, but it wasn't until I heard Tarantino talking about him that I like put the two and two together. Like, Oh, 48 hours and the long riders like, Oh, there's the same guy. You know, yeah. So that so Reservoir Dogs, and then um, maybe Amelie. After yeah. that, yeah, that's been on the list yeah, many times. Just, yeah, just a just a visual style, and it's so sweet it's, and it's beautiful. Film. Like I've done a I've done a lot of like nihilistic horror movies and stuff, so it always seems weird. But some of the things that affect me the most are these like basically like positive, sweet like j movies, and I, I don't know that one. Like I I, I can watch that over and over. Very cool. Now, where can people find you? So I have a website. Um, it's www.jhorton.com. Um, mm -hmm. You can pretty much find me on you know Twitter, Instagram, wherever at at jhorton. Mm -hmm. um, I, my YouTube is jhorton or the jhorton. Yeah. And that's about it. 
Very cool. Jay, man, you, you are an inspiration, sir, of, and, and a personification of the film entrepreneur method. So I do appreciate, uh, you coming on and, and dropping the knowledge bombs on the tribe, brother. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. I want to thank Jason for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe. He is a true film entrepreneur and is expanding his film entrepreneurial empire on a daily basis. I hope you get some inspiration from Jason and what he is doing because there is no excuse anymore why you as a filmmaker can't make a living doing what you love to do. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 417. And guys, again, don't forget about our Black Friday sale at IFH Academy. We also have cinematography courses, crowdfunding courses, the best-selling indie film producing workshop, as well as the Foundations of Screenwriting series, and so, so much more. Just head over to IFHAcademy.com. Thanks so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.